Welcome to Mastares. I'm playing catch up and this one is a bit time sensitive. Today's topic is another conversion video, taking the latest official release of the Shattered Obelisk and replacing all the old and played out Forgotten Realms elements with a superior and far more fun Mastara setting. Now we finished what we started all the way back at the beginning of 5th edition. We didn't have much Mastara converted to the new version then, but now we're ready. We're prepared. And we're making this adventure our own. I'm Mr. Welch, and it's time to be afraid. Very afraid. Fandelver and Below the Shattered Obelisk was released about two weeks ago from the recording of this video. It's 224 pages long, the same length as the Mastara Player's Guide. Amanda Hammond is the lead designer with a long list of artists and writers attached to it. I looked for the credits to see who originally wrote The Lost Mine of Fandelver, and it was Richard Baker and Chris Perkins. That wasn't easy to find. Strangely enough, Baker was fired from Watsi in 2011, and Fandelver came out in 2014. So 5th edition had been in the works long before the D&D Next titles were released because Murder in Baldur's Gate was released in 2013. Just some weirdness I found doing my research. But enough about me finding weird stuff in the timeline. The book has two parts. Everybody will mostly already own the first part. The Lost Mine of Fendelver from the original starter box set makes up a full third of this book with very few minor tweaks. Instead of going old school and making this part two of a series, we get a $60 book with duplicated pages. It wasn't fun when West End Games did it with Star Wars to pad out the pages, and it's not cool now. The old box set was $20 for 96 pages with handouts and dice. They could have done that again with more rule books. Throw in some new dice, and instead of a starter set, you now have an expert set. What I'm saying is this book is massively overpriced for what you get. And my wife hates the cover art for the friendly local game store special edition. They were going for the upside-down vibe of Stranger Things, I get it. And since that has Joyce Byers, I'm willing to cut them some slack, at least on the art. So you don't have to go back to watch my starter set video, because there are a few changes between that one and this book. I'm just going to cover the entire book here. The first thing you will notice is the consent warning on page 12, where Wizards has informed DMs that they can't mutate their player characters without their consent. Ignore that part. In fact, tear that page out and eat it. You won't need it, because we're not going to use Mind Flayers anyway. I've turned my characters into many things over my long decades as a DM. Corpses, stone statues, fish, vapor, ash outlines, smoking boots, platinum statues, art deco, Abe Vigoda. It's the risk you take when you play the game. If you don't think you've got players mature enough to deal with an adventure where bad things can happen to their characters, I suggest playing Toon. I didn't put much more thought into that warning, except maybe that it needed mustard. To get into the module conversions, you're going to need a copy of the Mastar Player's Guide. Also, you might want to go grab some of the monsters from the Vaults of Pandeus that were converted to 5th edition. Just Google the Mastar Player's Guide. It's over at rpgmp3.com as a free download. You can then take the POD to Lulu for a print version. Yes, legally I can't sell it, so it's free for the taking. There's also an Italian version available, and I would download both to make my Peninsular friends happy. Fandelvin is meant to be on the Sword Coast, because this is 5th edition Forgotten Realms. It has to be on the Sword Coast. The designers would break out in hives if they set it somewhere in the Moon Sea. Here we are moving the village to near Coringlane, about 250 miles south of where it needs to be overall, but it's the closest I can get without breaking the continuity too hard. As this means the module is going to start in Derrickin, we get to go on a friendly purge of not just non-Mastara friendly races, but most demi-humans as well. Derrickin is like 97% human. Most towns and villages are entirely human. The demi-humans live in their nations. Humanoids are considered hostile, and the other races are so rare as not to be present. In short, everybody that's not a filthy humanoid goblin type creature is a human. All the elves, dwarves, and hen are all now human. Derrickin gets along fine with the other races, well, the demi-human races, but they don't live in Derrickin. We aren't adding in diversity just for diversity's sake. Now let's get through the part you already own, a refresher into the Lost Mine. This adventure starts with the famous goblin fight, though not as good as the Siege of Suskian, but what is? This fight for new players can be pretty intimidating. It's a tough scrum if you don't know how to play. Veteran players, remember how many characters you lost and keep on the Borderlands? Same thing here, only with far more forgiving death mechanics. You will need to purge this module of the various Forgotten Realms specific factions, because obviously they aren't in Mastara. The Lord's Alliance you can replace with the Diplomatic Corps. You need to include the Knights of Ebony as a potential lead, because that's very important later on with our corrections. 
The other factions aren't as important. The Adventurers Club might be a good one to include. But there isn't an evil for evil sakes Mastara group like the Zentarum because nobody's going to join the Iron Ring. There's not much to convert for a good chunk of the starting module. All the monsters are stock bad guys you would expect in a low-level adventure. Bandits, goblins, wolves, things like that. Remember that the goblins will turn on the characters if they show weakness or mercy. The green-skinned wretches will act weak and cute, but then it's sneak attack time if the party turns their back or believes their pathetic cries. Once the characters are cleaned out the caves and the castle dungeons, that's when we start to make our first real alterations. The party will encounter a banshee, which is rather nerfed because no one's going to throw low-level adventurers into a monster that can TPK them in a single turn. A monster that they don't have any hope of killing at this level. Instead of a banshee, use a low-level hag in her place. A crone of chaos would be perfect here. It's supposed to be a non-combat scenario. You can still use the banshee if you'd like, but hags are the normal go-to for information at a price characters. A wise woman would also be perfect here, but you're not in the northern reaches, so she might be hard to justify. There's not a lot of conversions for the travel part, except for replacing the Grick with a Decapus. Then you get to Wave Echo Cave, where the bad guy is a drow in a setting without drow. You can just make him an evil elf or a humanoid wizard for better effect. Actually, go with that last one. This concludes the starter section of the adventure. Just one stock dungeon crawl after another. That's usually a bad thing, but this is an introductory module, so give it a pass. Now we're going to talk about the new stuff, the thing that we paid money for, the part that didn't come with a set of cool dice. The original story had a bunch of mind flayers trying to do some stuff in the Far Realms, real tentacle-inspired nightmare fuel. Tentacles might scare many people, but not me. Then again, I'm not Japanese. We need a better story, a scarier story, a Mastaran story. Mind flayers are gone now, but the Far Realms are still there. Instead of a bunch of mutated Mind Flayers, we'll start with a single Shadow Elf. I know they're supposed to be rare, but in this case, we need her. The single Shadow Elf went out exploring one day, and after some searching, she found herself standing outside the nucleus of the Spheres under Galantry City, the source of the Radiance. This should be awe-inspiring for a wizard who has no idea what she's looking at, but she didn't realize how much radiation she was absorbing. It's not through the wrong end. 15,000. She started feeling ill from radiation poisoning in the next few days. She cried out for Raphael, but found another immortal willing to answer her prayers. Eric, the patron of the Far Realms. The one immortal that gives Thanatos the willies. Eric was thrilled to help the stricken Shadow Elf. All he wanted in return for keeping her from dying of acute radiation sickness was one teensy-weensy favor, and that was to help bring one of the great old ones into the material plane and turn Mastara into a world of madness and death. That wasn't too much to ask, was it? The Shadow Elf, out of her mind in pain and agony, agreed. Once she did that, all of her suffering ended. That doesn't mean he cured all of the radiation burns that covered her skin. So I'll remove the cause. <laughs> but not the symptom. But at least she was capable of rational thought again. We've got to give the Shadow Elf a name. We just can't keep calling her Shadow Elf for the entire video, so... Let's call her Sorota. Sorota was tasked with finding a better source of the Radiance to power the spells needed to open the Gate to the Far Realms. She couldn't use the Nucleus directly. It took immortal magic to heal her of the damage she suffered just looking at it for a couple of minutes. Trying to siphon from it would be fatal regardless of any magical protection. But thanks to her exposure, she could now see the Radiance and even see who had absorbed it. This is where she also noticed the soul stones, the sacred stones that the Shadow Elves obsessed over, absorbed radiation, which was precisely the opposite of what she wanted. She headed to the surface to try to find people that possessed the power of the Radiance. It wasn't easy. She was horribly scarred from her encounter with the Nucleus, and she glowed like a Chernobyl rave at night. But at least nobody was going to suspect she was a Shadow Elf. She discovered she had developed the power to control people that she irradiated sufficiently. The problem was, is if the creatures weren't capable of handling the Radiance already, the dosage required for her to control them was lethal. The goblins she encountered gained all sorts of new magical powers under her control, allowing them to do quite a bit of damage before their internal organs turned to soup. Creatures that didn't receive a lethal dose from her had a habit of mutating out of control or rising as irradiated zombies in some cases. This was all well and good for the minion department, but she needed competent help. She found those when she encountered a couple of sorcerers who were secretly disciples of the Radiance. Blanchurians who were born infused with magical radiation after their parents had absorbed enough rads. 
She couldn't control them, their natural resistance to dying of radiation poisoning prevented that. But she could influence them to help her. It was not like she needed to control them. They viewed her as a messenger from the immortals, with her radioactive deformities and all. One of the two disciples was from Crown Guard, and confided that he suspected Brannert McGregor, Prince of Clantier, knew something about the radiance. The disciples could detect radiance, and McGregor's tower glowed with it. They managed to get a message to the prince, explaining in coded terms about the radiance. The vain prince agreed to meet them, confident in his powers and always willing to torture fools for more information on the radiance. When he saw the shadow elf glowing with radiance energy, she had his full attention. She struck a deal with him. He would gain a new path of immortality in exchange for helping them open a portal to another world, where they could harness even more magical energy. So Rhoda didn't realize that McGregor was the first Radiance Lich, a creature far more powerful than her. He didn't realize that she was channeling immortal powers. While Eric couldn't control the prince, his influence would take a toll on McGregor's sanity. The Disciples of the Radiance gathered the few brethren that they knew of, and the group formed a cabal devoted to using the Radiance to open up a new realm where they could harness its magic and achieve divinity. Now, we have made this module very Mastarin. The Cabal soon found that another group had first discovered the Radiance and had created the Obelisks in response. The Obelisks were originally Nithian in design, because every forgotten statue in Mastara is Nithian. The Obelisks safely absorb Radiance magic, and there was a ring of them surrounding Glantry and other lands, but nobody remembers who built them because Nithians. Why does the Radiance stop at Glantry's borders? Blame the Nithians. But the Radiant Cabal needed the Radiance to spread, so they needed an obelisk to study. The issue was getting close to an obelisk that would drain the Radiance from the environment, and also from them. McGregor plans to figure out how the obelisks absorb Radiance, but reverse it. They don't know the source of the obelisks or how they work. They just know that when they approach them, the obelisk takes all their Radiance and magic away from them. Fortunately for them and the plot, Fandelvin has pieces of a damaged obelisk that the Cabal can steal. The goblins that raid the village are saturated with Radiance magic. Lethally so, so they all die shortly after the raid, but there's always more goblins to irradiate. They will have a few spells granted to them by the Radiance, giving them the abilities of a third level wizard. Each spell removes a level of radiation. When they cast five spells, they turn to ash. If you want to make radiation especially dangerous, here's how you do it. First, it's not Radiance damage. Is that type of damage, despite its name, is supposed to represent holy damage. Well, nine times out of ten. There is one spell where it's radiation, and there's another spell where it's focus light. Wizards never did clarify that. We're changing it to fire or poison, depending on whether it's a physical attack or an aura. Don't pick up that smoking stone, that causes fire damage. Don't stand too close to the glowing half-melted elf, that causes poison damage. Now here's where it gets scary. Radiation damage ignores all relevant resistances or immunities living creatures have unless it's from a spell or a magic item. A fire giant picks up the glowing rock and it takes fire damage. A yawn tea stands too close to the glowing Scotsman, he takes poison damage. And gets Scotland the Brave stuck in his head for 1d4 hours. Worse, this damage reduces maximum hit points because it's acute radiation sickness. This can only be cured with a restoration spell like 5th edition's quasi energy drain rules. While you have radiation damage, you also have the poison condition. That will get the party's attention. But the ultimate throwback that the party doesn't know about? Rockborn dwarves are entirely immune to the draining effects of radiation. They can't be poisoned by it, and their hit points aren't permanently reduced. Just like Kagiar designed them after the Great Rain of Fire. But the party has an out. Soul stones prevent radiation damage. They even absorb it. Standard soul stones will absorb 10 points of radiation damage before wearing out and they prevent lingering damage from having any lasting effects. The psionic mind stones and shattered obelisks become soul stones, and their rarity increases the damage absorbed by 10 points per level. If you use the mind stone for its normal ability, it's expended, but a rare mind stone will absorb 40 points of radiation, 10 to start with, and then add another 10 points of absorption for every rarity level. So common, uncommon, and rare add 10, 20, and 30. Soul stones absorb radiation from weakest to strongest, so a base soul stone will eat the radiation before a magical one. However, if it does wear out, the extra damage automatically goes to the next lowest soul stone. They will keep you safe from Brannert's lethally radioactive aura, but only for a little while. Remember that. You will need to create some radiant sorcerers to replace the mind flayers. Start them with 20 radiance points, a level on par with the mind flayers hit dice. 
That will be around level 8 for most mind flayers, with the mutated flayers getting replaced by higher level sorcerers. Keep the added flayer powers from their mutations for the disciples. The extra abilities like tentacles and such are now caused by radiation. Add an extra 10 points of rad per level increase. All of the sorcerers are mutated to some degree with radiation poisoning. You can give them masks or cover their face to disguise the radiation burns. Sorota starts with 100 rad and her two sidekicks get, give him 75. McGregor, of course, is a radiation lich, so he has all the lich powers, but exchange several of his spells with radiant spells as needed. He's got 150 radiance minimum. His attacks do radiation damage without the paralyzation. But if you fail the saving throw, you take the damage again as poison in addition to the heat damage that it normally causes. Worse, he's got an aura that works like the sickening radiance spell from Xanathar's. In short, it's a 30-foot aura that causes 4d10 radiance damage and a level of exhaustion against anyone entering or ending their turn in the effect, unless they make a saving throw. Change the radiance damage to poison, and there you go. And this aura is always on. Bring soul stones when you face McGregor. You have been warned. Repeatedly. If the party defeats him, he reforms back in his castle, where his phylactery is. He is still a radioactive undead creature with a hatred of all human life, but he will be free from the influences of Eric. He might thank the party later by offering them a merciful death. He does owe them one, and he's a big softy in that regard. Alright, now let's finish the module. The party finds themselves in a dwarven ruin. Originally this was supposed to be Dwergar, but now it's an abandoned dwarven mine from when the Glantrians drove them out. Their dead have been raised as ashen whites from the effects of the tainted radiance. The party is chasing the goblins who raided the town, looking for captives. The other radiated monsters, like the Grit, can be played as is. Remember to turn them into radioactive horrors from the Cold War. Change the psychic wards to the relevant types, as psychic damage is not a significant factor in the conversion for apparent reasons. But magical fire and poison resistance would work well in its place. If you need to bolster the party's defenses, have soul stones randomly growing out of the wall as needed. You need to keep them well stocked with soul stones if they have any hope of surviving this adventure. Now the party gets to chase down the conspiracy. This will become a race against time as Eric has a master plan in place and he's maneuvering his pawns into position as the party goes after them. Eric's master plan is to get the Cabal into the Far Realms, specifically the Shadow Elf and McGregor. He can then leech their radiance from them and channel that into a powerful spell that will open up a portal into the Prime. He can send at least one Great Old One through. He can't open the portal on the Prime, as the other Immortals would detect his attempts to stop him. Plus, that much Radiance will draw the attention of Etienne de Amberville. But in the Far Realms, only Eric maintains a presence there of all the Immortals. He can work in peace without alerting the Council of Intrusion. Sirota and Branart are just walking radioactive batteries for the Twisted Immortal, nothing else. Every other Immortal would try to stop him if he opens the portal. But it would be far too late by then. Even now, with the Radiance energy he's already acquired, creatures from the Far Realms are starting to manifest on the Prime. There are a few adventures in the town if the party returns. They have to deal with the increased exposure from the Far Realms. Find a lost child and bring him back. Watch a horribly mutated cow explode into irradiated gray oozes. Play up the body horror, and drop even more hints that this is going to get much worse before it gets any better. The party will have clues on where the missing pieces of the obelisk are, leading to more dungeon crawls. Cue the Shadow Elves. The dungeon Talhundareth was a dwarven complex, originally an underground temple. This can be traced back to Glantry, or at least before the dwarves were cast out. The temple is filled with background radiation. Not enough to damage regularly, but if you live there for a few weeks, it starts to mess with your mind. Then you mutate. All the creatures the characters will find have been here for some time and are now mutated monstrosities. They will also find a few Shadow Elves looking for their lost father. The Elves will not say they are Shadow Elves. They will pretend to be any other type of Elf. The characters aren't going to know what a Shadow Elf even is. The Elves' father fell under the sway of Sirota, and his Soul Stones have long since worn out. He's become one of the Mutates, while his sons still have functional Soul Stones that protect them from the radiation. It turns out the Obelisk Fragments leak radiation, and holding on to them is a very bad idea unless you shield them. If the party helps the Shadow Elves, they give them common level soul stones to ward off the radiation and explain how they work. These soul stones will not expire above the surface because the stones are magical items. There's not much else to convert here, keeping the non mastar and monsters as mutated horrors trying to eat the party, with a Disciple of the Radiance in place of the Mind Flare boss at the end. 
When the party returns to Fandelvin, the town has become even more perilous. Several people are going mad, and a sinkhole is opened in the city where the radioactive goblins are spilling out of. Time for the party to f reach the scary part of the adventure. Remember to replace all the psychic attacks with either fire or poison damage from the radiance to keep with the theme. The further the party goes, the more messed up the caverns and tunnels become as the far realms are bleeding through. Eventually the walls become... organic. Doors are living flesh that open like maws as players approach. It's not dangerous, but it is pretty gross. It also lets McGregor know where the party is precisely. Demons, devils, and other outer planar creatures found in this adventure become denizens of the Far Realms. Add more tentacles if you need for maximum effect. The Alhoun Mind Flayer Vampire is now a heavily mutated Radiance Disciple who has acquired a powerful Soul Stone that allowed it to break its connection with Eric and the Great Old Ones. It's more than willing to talk and will even help the party for all their Soul Stones. That's not a good idea. But even if they refuse, it's not going to hinder them. It's trying to undo its mutations, not become hostile. The characters are going to fight through many mutated Radiant Sorcerers. If the party gets sick of them, then you as a Dungeon Master have done an excellent job. There's also a lot of mutated humans, empowered goblins, and a lot of weird monsters standing in for things like Nothic Slot and similar. But then you get to one of the big bads. In the room where the Elder Brain is supposed to be is Prince Brennan McGregor, the Radiance Lich. And he's not happy to see the party. His mind is muddled, but his powers aren't diminished. Eric has assaulted McGregor since he arrived in this location. The prince's sanity is about to snap, and he has become so hostile and unpredictable that the other Cabal members have left him to his own devices here. This should be an epic fight that the players will remember. No one's coming to help Brannard. He has a bad habit of blasting people that annoy him, and he screams quite a lot. He's so temperamental that even hearing people recreating the Battle of Iwo Jima in a 35-foot square room isn't unusual. It's going to be a tough fight, and probably a deadly one, if the party doesn't have several soul stones. So make sure they've stocked up on them before they get here. Now the party gets to visit the Far Realms. They are on Eric's home turf. And it's getting freaky, like Ralph Bakshi dropping acid freaky. The party will find weird monsters, impossible physics, and you get to use one of H.P. Lovecraft's favorite terms, non-Euclidean geometry, and quite often. There's not a lot of danger in Chapter 7. It's there to put your characters ill at ease more than anything else, because things are about to get very real, or in this adventure's case, very surreal. If the party returns to Fandelvin one last time to resupply, they see what fate awaits Mistara. It's a nightmare realm. Everyone present is horribly mutated. The buildings have mutated into eldritch horrors. If you need examples... Imagine if David Cronenberg had become an interior designer. Then stop, because you'll need to sleep before you run the end of this adventure. The party dives back into the Far Realms for one last showdown. There are many freaky monsters and a chance encounter with Githyanki. And remember, if one of the party has joined the Knights of Ebony, you're going to have a real fun time with that bit of dialogue. The two groups are well aware of each other and get along as well as a Minotaur at a Matador convention. They can be talked into fighting alongside the party and the characters will need all the help they can get. But Mastarans do not like outer planar creatures, and this adventure is not helping with that mindset. There's also some flumps, which might lead to some hilarious conversations, because when it comes to good aligned outsiders, Mastarans think of the holier than thou celestials. The characters might be a tad bit suspicious and murdery. An amethyst dragon and human ally are looking to get out of the far realm, and while the party might be suspicious, at least they know what a dragon is. It will offer to help, but it's unwilling to take the necessary risks to do so effectively. There's an Arcanoloth that serves as an exposition dump, and if you want the party to fight an Aboleth, this is the best place to find one. Then the characters get to the final boss after running around multiple messed up locations and getting covered in more gunk than they thought possible. There are some trapped fiends here that want nothing more than to get out, but they're not willing to fight because death here is permanent for them. The party finds the three leaders of the Cabal and any minions that are left. And it's a fight to the death. After that, once they've stopped the ritual, the obelisk is restored, it absorbs all the radiation nearby, and collapses into dusk. Everyone is cured of any possible radiation poisoning, and they all live happily ever after. At least until the creature that was behind all of this attacks the parties they try to leave. Keep this fight as is. It hints at the horrors of the Far Realms, and it's like nothing the party has ever faced. They're going to need all the help they can get, especially if they used up most of their resources fighting the Cabal. Good luck! That is the epic conversion of the Shattered Obelisk into a pure Mistaran module. 
it's going to be a meat grinder, one that the players will remember. If they're lucky, McGregor won't remember them. If they're really lucky, they never have to go back to the Far Realms. As for Eric, if the Entropic Immortals learn what he tried to do, he's getting stuffed back into a locker. Next time, I'm doing another deep dive into the riverboat Crimshine, a gnomish craft that plies the waterways of Karamikos. Until then, I am Tentacles.